that one good, because Nir is actually supposed to open. So first of all, just welcome everyone here. Thanks for being here. And is this what? Probably what um, excites me the most. You know, how do we actually make use of this atlas? How do we uh, do the computational querying of it in a way that provides powerful, robust, correct, meaningful biology? So near to you. Yeah. So. Um the premise for this for this uh, for this session is uh, continuing what we've seen in the last two days and what we see as a community for the past couple of years, which is the maturation of this entire project. Right, data sets start to accumulate. We see those in the public domain. Uh, we see multiple annotations from multiple groups. All of this comes together, and uh, as a let's say computationally inclined uh, a group here, we can start thinking about the, the challenges that we have ahead of us. Uh, and if you frame those uh, very generally, and I don't know if you can see the slides here. Let me see if we do like that. Yeah, no, the, the, yeah, the slides aren't showing. Um, can, you sh can you put our slides up? Because we see them here, but not a... Uh... Yeah. Okay. All right. By okay. the way, if there's some biologically inclined people, we're, we'll, we're welcoming you to stay. Please stay. To, 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 Please to really... Stay drive what we apply our computational minds to. We really want, yes, we're indeed. hoping that, that there are some, you know, biologists, I see some in the back, very quiet, smiling. <laughs> what? Yeah. Is, who here, at, you know, has biological domain expertise? Raise your hand. OK, there. All right, fantastic. Yeah, of course, this is uh, essential for anything that we're going to be discussing here, right? So. Um, when we wrote the, the abstract for that meeting, right, we thought about these three pronged or three different phases of, of challenges that we have, which has to do with the integration of data and transfer of annotations that people have talked about here and in previous meetings of, of the UMSL Atlas, but also how to take it forward and do new things, exact new insight from data that is out there. So a lot of uh, really exciting things to talk about. Uh, here we just put a snapshot, right, of, of some of the, uh, and, and please forgive me if yours is not there, but really some of the, uh, the efforts that are ongoing now, uh, both in data collection, in data curation, and at the bottom is, is the endeavor and where we want to get it. Done, so, you know, I'm just going to repeat my slide from yesterday's presentation, was, which was really supposed to sort of like uh, feed some thoughts for what I hope we will discuss today. And really at the center of it all is how do we query the Atlas? Because what type of questions we'd like to ask the Atlas, what we'd like to be able to learn from the Atlas as added value in addition to simple stamp collecting. And, you know, we want to do stamp collecting well, but the whole endeavor is so that we can get added value, added knowledge. So what are the most important questions that we want to tackle first as a community? We need to define the questions and then how this will impact the way we integrate the sufficient statistics and, and how we get there. So what I thought we'll you know, do today in this actual discussion-oriented thing where I will try and shut up, even though it's against my nature, and, and hear from you, is first of all, let's start with some optimism, some success stories. So if anyone has an exciting, I queried the Atlas and, oh, wow, what did I learn? That you know, will we'll, we'll sort of energize us with success. Then we're going to sort of throw around what we think are the most important queries. We're going to take a vote as a community, and I hope the online people can participate. Are you able to tabulate uh, votes? John. There, there's some like voting option in, in, in Zoom. So yeah, we're going to try and also encourage all our online people to, to vote. And then we'll dig in technically to these queries and see how we could do something practical about it. So let's start with the, the first question. Yeah, so uh, everybody can see our first question, right? It's, um, yeah, please go ahead. Success uh, stories. Does anyone have an exciting, you know, um, optimistic success story? I learned this from the Atlas. I made this query, and wow, it was great. And, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a voting thing. Can, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll get you one. Yeah, no, no, you need, uh, we, we need more mic, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we can pass this one around, just okay. in case, folks. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm Graham Hamburg from Genentech. Um, 
recently we've been collecting a lot of data, as many of you have, and querying it. And the idea we've been looking for is to try to find similar cells to a query cell across other data sets. And so I guess part of the success story is we've been looking for a specific type of macrophages that we think are um, important in pulmonary fibrosis. And we find them, A, across other pulmonary fibrosis data sets, so suggesting it's a general feature of pulmonary fibrosis. B, we find them in other diseases, um, which you know, raises new biological questions. And then lastly, we find them in a few in vitro conditions, which suggests a new model system for studying this specific cell state. So I'm glad that there's some success stories. You guys are a little bit either tired and didn't drink enough coffee or we don't have any success with all this effort. Uh, I have another question for you. So you shared a success with us. What in your mind or in your intuition was the sort of computational modeling choice or that little nuanced thing you did to make it work? I know probably a lot of, a lot of thing went yeah, into it, but you know, try and summarize the essence of what, how you think you got it to work. There were a lot of tricks uh, that you know, the details will be published soon, hopefully. Um, but I guess one thing that I would say is that I think is maybe unique and led to, I think, probably the most exciting stuff is using data sets we didn't expect to look in. Um, I think we've seen a lot of effort around aggregating, you know, let's say, many lung data sets. And that's where we started as well. I mean, that makes sense. Um, but, you know, for example, the in vitro systems, maybe that's the most exciting aspect of this. And what we found is these were completely unrelated to fibrosis. And, you know, had we gone out to hand select a few data sets to query and integrate and stuff like that, we would have never included these. So I think probably the main takeaway for me was, uh, you know, increasing the scope beyond uh, kind of what you're thinking of is relevant uh, led to probably the newest insights. Yeah, that's, I think, you know, again, great, you know, unintended, I didn't plant them in the audience, uh, a commercial for why we should work as a community to build a, a big, comprehensive, and, and inclusive atlas. Any other success stories? Ah, okay. So I started my first single cell project. Of, ah, I'm sorry, I just arrived. Uh, my name is Rob, and I'm Christoph Box Group at SAM here. Um, so I started my first single cell project a few months ago, and I wanted to annotate different types of cells and subtypes, and I found it really easy that there was a pre-annotated set of cells there. I could just use a tool that was already there for me to use, and it was a relatively easy process, whereas in the past with bulk projects I've had to manually, similar to what we just heard, manually go through many data sets, combine them myself, and this was just a lot so easier. So what tool did you use? Uh, ScanV or SC, I don't know how you pronounce it, ScanV? ScanV. Yeah. Fabian will be here. Originally ScanVI, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, variational inference mm -hmm. yeah. is the technical jargon. Yeah. Can you pass it behind you? Cool. Hi, I'm Sikander from University Clinic in Aachen, and I really love using SCVI. I hope that's how you pronounce it. Um, and I've run like it on like 600 or maybe 700 samples from public data. Can you take off your mask because it's uh, muffled? Yeah. yeah. Sure. And um, it's really, really cool. Um, uh, the university is after me because I use a lot of GPUs now for SCVI, so I have to take secret identity. But uh, what I really liked was um, that um, we were trying to integrate our own data set to an existing, you know, to annotate it. And we used like K KPMP, the kidney atlas was really, really cool there uh, because we could then have standardized annotation. One problem we found was that, imagine just take randomly fibroblasts. You take one data set, second data set, you know, everyone is naming fibroblasts like one, two, three, four, five. Another one would say A, B, C, D, whatever. And you don't know the A of one and this is compatible or not. So if we can really annotate them together, that was really, really useful. Um, but I have maybe a question for you that maybe you will deal with later. Um, these tools are really computationally expensive, so I mean, jokes apart in a way that 
you know, there are countries and labs that are not so resource intensive. Um, is there a way to like, you know, include more, let's say, resource limited computational ways to use SCVI and similar tools? Thanks. That's a fantastic question. And this is, uh, I mean, first of all, just to repeat what you said about another motivation for, a, let's say, a success story for integration, right? It's, uh, so we heard about the ability to see things that you didn't expect yeah. from Graham. But from you, uh, we heard about the ability to bridge across different data sets, different annotations, and really get some consensus view of what is your cell type, what is your system, where does it fall with respect to the literature. And when it comes to um, making these tools more available, and that's absolutely something we care about a lot, um, as of now, you can run them on the cloud, on, on platforms like Google Colab and others, and some of them were mentioned here. But um, one thing that is nice, if you are really buying into this form of representation of the data with this compression based on variation autoencoders, and this is just, let's say, it's one way to do that, right? Of course, there can be many ways. It provides a compressed form of the data. So in a sense, there are a lot of computations that can be done in a way that is very thin, both on, in memory and in compute resources, right? So just to uh, appease the, uh, and provide maybe one level of, of detail here is Fabian mentioned yesterday the SC Arches um, platform that basically sits on top of these variation autoencoders and just does a very slight change to them to overlay your own data onto a certain atlas. In order to be able to do that, uh, the amount of computation is minimal. You don't need to train this entire neural network. You really need only to train a handful of edges there, if you will. So uh, we have recently started working together with Fabian on this. And we're fortunate to get some funding from CZI uh, for that, exactly for that purpose, uh, making a model repository. Yeah, so I didn't want to, you know. Uh, do too much advertising to, 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 to ourselves here, but, but uh, we are making this model repository available so you can download the model and then you can run all these analysis really with minimal compute. So we are just entering this right now and hopefully this is something we'll be able to release. Just, oh, just to add on that, so that's one strategy, right? Somebody else trains and you just do the extra and that's more available to people. And the other is that we've started talking to some funders about the question of approaching, say, tech companies for them to actually in kind make some of this access more available to people. So that there isn't actually a differential for those who want to say develop a new method or train a new model, that shouldn't also not be, should also not be out of reach. So hopefully more to come on that at some point. So let's see if we can hear uh, one more success story, this time um, from, oh, I'm trying to encourage, I understand there's supposed to be an on, online uh, participation, so I'm trying to encourage, is there anyone online with a success story that wants to join us virtually and talk with us? Okay, the online people haven't really woken up yet or are zonked out. Okay, so we'll do a success story here. Perfect, I'm Katie from Genentech. Um, it's sort of a general success story. I bet that people are often querying the atlas to improve resolution of spatial transcriptomic methods. Like every, every method kind of has its own downfall. Um, and so let's say that you were interested in a particular disease. There are lots of healthy tissue atlases you can query now and try to um, ask what cell types would be present either to build up your um, uh, panel if it's sort of a fish-based atlas or to uh, increase, in, increase the resolution kind of like you talked about here. So. Yeah, lots of success stories uh, from Aviv's lineage, not surprising. Um, so now, the, now is the really fun part. We're going to define, and here I really hope that the biologists will jump in because they're, they're our, you know, our, our guiding light. What are the queries? What are the most important queries? I mean, there's so many queries um, one can do, but as you know, I said yesterday, even where is my gene expressed or you know, which cells are similar to this one is, is technically challenging. So you know, we have to sort of prioritize. So everyone's gonna throw queries and try and make them as well-defined as possible. We'll write them down, we'll vote, and we'll try and dig into a few of these technically by consensus voting. So who wants to throw um, their most passionate query for, for discussion? Hey, my, um, in the Atlas, I often look for a marker name, gene. Name oh, sorry, I'm uh, Laure Emmanuel. I'm working in France in a part of the long uh, cell atlas. 
So most of the time I look for a gene, um, list of marker gene for a specific cell type, and in some atlases, sometimes you cannot, uh, in some browsing, cannot get them. So based on the score, specificity score, um, um, yeah, of uh, high gene expression, but uh, top marker genes for a specific cell type. This would be my query. So which are the top marker genes for cell type, like from the data? Yes, if you uh, browse the, um, the data set and you select one specific cell type you're inserted in, in this data set, w what is the, top, the list of the top marker genes? So I have a question for you as a, a biologist. So one of the things that I've encountered is on one hand these atlases can provide marker genes driven from the data, driven in an unbiased way where you compare it against everything else and the entire transcriptome, get all these statistics and all these wonderful things. But I've actually encountered, and anyone can, 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 can jump in, a lot of resistance to, to changing tech book, textbook marker genes. It's like, no, no, these are my markers for the cell type, and don't tell me otherwise. So, I mean, obviously, since this is what you asked for, you're not in that camp. Yeah. But how much of that camp do you feel that you have in your community? I think in the transcriptomics community, not so much, because we have understood that uh, marker gene can be very context dependent. Or, for instance, in our lung atlas, uh, marker gene within the whole atlas, if you compare a specific type of epithelial cells, won't be the same marker gene list if you compare within the epithelial cells your specific cell type. So in our community, but we are a lot in transcriptomics anyway, there is not such resistance. And of course, you're happy if you see your marker genes with the antibody that you have always used. You're very happy about it. But every time somebody starts a new single cell project with us or around us, uh, we always say, uh, don't worry if you don't find your favorite gene. It's fine because you have capture efficiency. You have all kind of bias that maybe your gene list won't be the one you expect, but you have metrics to control that and to see how specific and how high the genes are expressed. So, but this is something really important and we are always ask that for people in our institute not working in single cell, they have questions about, we are in a lot, um, a brain institute, and they always come to me and say, okay, I want to see this cell type and uh, I want to see my gene or I want to see the, a, new cell, a new gene to detect this cell type. And I go into atlases and sometimes it's not easy to get this uh, list of marker genes. Okay, uh, John, you have someone from online? Uh, yes, we have a comment and a question from our uh, online participants. Um, so Fadi al Aqua from Michigan says, uh, just comments that uh, Azimuth is a good tool that they use to map data to different tissue atlases. And we have an anonymous question. If the data we want to integrate to the atlas uh, keep increasing, how do we know when the scale or configuration of the pre-trained model needs to be updated to reflect the complexity of the newly incoming data? So again, that Everything depends on the queries, which is why we're, we're starting here. Uh, everything is really, you know, the complexity and did you integrate well and, and, and how do you need to integrate and how many, so it, pretty much everything from your sample design, how do we design what data we collect all the way through, how do we integrate it, how do we know we have enough, how do we know we have a good enough answer, all that resides on what do we want to use the Atlas for, which is our focus now. Do you want to add something to that, Nir? Uh, no, but, but that's, I guess, connecting with the first comment about on Azimuth, uh, I think that the multiplicity of solutions that are out there, it's a, it's a blessing in a sense, right? Because it really allows us to, uh, to probe issues of complexity. Different models can have different amount of resolutions, almost in different areas of the data. It has to do with the, the intricacies of how models are optimized. So, so that's really connected with that first comment. Yeah, I really think Malte did a great job by explaining that, you know, everyone, there's a lot of, you know, one of the things I like about the HCA is, is it's not a competition, it's a collaboration. And, you know, almost for any method out there, there's no winner. There's a winner depending on the data set you're using and what you're using it for. And there's no one best method, one answer. It's very dependent. Biology, you know, the different systems have such different statistical characteristics. And, it's, and, and what you need to optimize, there's, everything is a trade-off. There's no free lunch, particularly data integration. You, there's just simply no free lunch. And, 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 and 
where you need to take that trade off really depends on what you want to do with the data. So more, so we have one query up for, for, for voting. Um, you want, in, in response to Laura Manuel's query and your question on that, I think one thing that I hear a lot that biologists want is kind of a minimal set of cell surface markers. Yeah. Because those are the way in which you can prospectively isolate cells and do other things with them for their identification. So it's kind of a finer version. And for that, people are willing to give up things that they did use initially to characterize the cells because you can't use them because they're not cells. So we'll add that to the query. Yeah, know. and the, minima the minimality Marker, is really minimal important. Minimal set of markers with you know, a, a, a strong priority to try and get some cell surface ones. Even though, if, even if you get cell surface ones, some of the antibodies still suck. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Um, but, but if it's based on SiteSeq, for example, right? So at least you have some support from the data. So at least you can go with that, right? Well, SiteSeq won't allow you to then sort. No, no, of course not. But at least you can base it on that. Yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Marcel Brousseau of Vanderbilt University. Um, I'm a biologist. I'm a biologist. Uh, so we are uh, coordinating uh, pancreas bio network. As a biologist, what I find um, to be very helpful is a really multidisciplinary teams and uh, people coming to, to, to the problem uh, with computational resources, biology insight, and, and really working together as a, in a unison. And I would like to hear from you, what are your thoughts, uh, for example, not only in terms of integration of uh, data sets coming from one modality from different different groups, but for example, multimodal approach has a great value to, for example, diabetes as a polygenic disease, where you can uh, integrate spatial data with, for example, um, multi-ohm uh, single nucleus attack, RNA, seq data, because chromatin uh, information, at least for diabetes, seems to be uh, very important in terms of linking uh, information to larger population studies, uh, variants, and genome-wise um, association studies. So I think question to you would be, okay, uh, we heard a lot about benchmarking different data sets coming from one, one modality, but how do you then uh, build the atlas that will allow to integrate spatial information, chromatin information, and, you know, so that people can take it all the way to population studies using, for example, UK Biobank working with um, statistical geneticists and figure out, you know, uh, is, is this variant causal, for example? So, so your query is, again, because as I said, we, we all intend to do data integration. The reason you see more RNA is it's more mature, there's more data, there's a lot of things that you need a critical mass of data collected with a critical mass of expertise to begin doing. And, and certainly, the, you know, in our charter, we want to get to attack and spatial, and we, we can't wait, to, you know, it can't come quick enough, but the reason, you know, I mean, for RNA, we saw earlier, you know, a, a, a two million cell atlas just for the lung, uh, so that's why there's so much on RNA. But again, all these things, how you integrate, like, let's collect all this data, collect all these patients, integrate all these things. It has to be rooted on, on, on what the question is. So your question is, which are the causal variants? Or, I mean, causal variants we get from genome association, so maybe I can, you know, take the liberty to refine it in, in you know, in what cell types or cell niches do these, um, you know, causal variants matter, because the causal variants you get from GWAS. So your question would be, you how know, do you understanding get how, how, you know, understanding the GWAS causal variants in terms of cell type and cell niche? Exactly. All right, that's a great question. Yeah, and just to add to that, there is some, as, as you know, as we know, there is some uncertainty, even when you have the causal variants, right? We have all these huge LD blocks, and we don't know exactly where it falls, and so on, and uh, I think that there is definitely, as, as a query, this sounds like something very attractive that can be contributed by tools like that, right? When you have a view of the, of the epigenome, either with methylation or accessibility, it's much more accessible right now. Um, so, and as numbers increase, 
uh, of donors and samples. I think that's definitely, it sounds like a great, very interesting type of query to me. But I'm curious, you mentioned also the spatial data there. So, so how does that play into the, uh, so, so we have this the variant part, but how do you see that in terms of, of query that is interesting? It's on. Uh, okay, it's, it is on. Uh, well, uh, I think um, uh, s some of the some of the talks that we listen to uh, day one and day two, you know, niches where the cells live, right? I, I think those are understanding their their uh, molecular molecular um, architecture and 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 where how 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 does spatial organization influences that um, uh, you know we see it in uh, in pancreas. Uh, um, uh, assembly of uh, cells, for example, within pancreatic islets, it's really important for their functional outputs. And you know, uh, there are now, for example, tools where you can uh, do in situ functional profiling of the cells and be able to link it to their molecular architecture. So I think also it's kind of thinking down, 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 down the road. How do you, because ultimately function is going to matter the most, right? And how what is underpinning molecular profile of those cells and where, where, where they are in the space within the tissue that truly matters. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, Nir, to, to, to refine it, what, some of the things that we're seeing with, with some of our spatial analysis, is which, which is usually little, you know, you know, mom and pop, you know, bespoke applications rather than something big, is one, mutations can really disrupt spatial architecture in a very big way. So if you have a causal variant, it's certainly not as big as some of the mutations we do with CRISPR, but uh, it could have impact uh, even more subtle on the spatial uh, architecture and population of niches. And we see the same cell type, which, you know, all these labeling efforts that, that we talked about here would give the same name, having very different roles depending on its niche and who it's talking to. And, and, and um, you know, I, I think of it as, you know, we've been thinking about how molecules inside a cell come together to function, but, you know, the next step is how, you know, cells come together in a niche to create a joint uh, function. And so all these things is, is where causal variants really can propagate on how the niche is formed and how it interacts with the niche. And I can definitely see how spatial matters. That's actually a really cool question. But let's throw a couple more questions out there so we can then uh, vote. Um, um, Andrew, Farmer, Takara. Uh, what about change, not just where my genes express, but if you've got like a longitudinal study or a comparison between, I don't know, patient and a disease and normal, you want to know where my, where my gene or my set of genes has changed. So you want to know where, and, and, and can you define where in a more precise way? Well, where would be, which particular cell types is this changing in, right? You might be looking at a, you know, say, say your lung, lung set, right? You, mm -hmm. you, you want to find um, cells that have changed in some way. Cha so the so do you want to know where my genes is uh, change in what, so there are two yeah. separate queries. It, mm. One focuses on the gene and says, you know, I care about this gene or gene program and where right. and in what cells is it changing. And a completely different query, which, you know, necessitates completely different computation, is a more unbiased, uh, well, there's actually three. What cells are, are, are changing in their expression or what cells are changing in their population frequencies. There's actually, you know. All of, all of the above. All of the right. above. But cha I mean, think, I think the bottom line, change is important, right? Mm -hmm. Different. Even though you've just defined three queries. I mean, all of them are interesting, but yeah. That, Maybe that's, I'm greedy. If you had to choose one of them, if I put <laughs> you to the wall. Um, well, I. I I don't, I don't think I want to ch choose. I think change is important. <laughs> you want to look at them all. No, I, I agree. I, all of those are important. Right? I agree. agree. I'm just, I'm, 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 it, the problem is, I agree with you that it's all important, but the problem is that, you know, computationally, each one of your asks is, is a challenge in itself. So it's not that I, I want to say I only want to solve one. We're just trying to get some prioritization here. So 
you know, we can actually hit the ground and get real progress. Yeah, but, but generally, contextualizing this comparative uh, analysis that, that you do, right, um, that let's say the, uh, not a part of the cell atlas efforts, right, but really looking at the specific, as you said, for example, looking at some lung infection and so on, right, so, so that's one of the premises, right, of the human cell atlas, and that's, I mean, so I, I agree that this is a very important type of query that can be looked, considered in different modes and different sub-queries, if you will, there in composition, the differential expression and so on, yeah. John? Uh, yes, I just want to add a vote for a spatial genus question from uh, Ruvimbo uh, Mishi from the University of Cape Town. He says, my question of interest would be, where is a particular gene expect expected to be found spatially? Okay, that's a good one. Where is a particular gene spatially? Okay. Yeah, my question would be like, how does cellular heterog uh, heterogeneity that we observe affect cell function and potential? Mm -hmm. How would, and I'm going to really put you on the spot, how do you define cellular heterogene heterogeneity? I mean, I think part of this comes down to also what Aviv was saying about like, what is a cell type? Um, we have these classifications of cell types, and there's a spectrum in terms of their, like, you know, what they are like. And like, that maybe affects what that cell can become as well. So our lab is interested in epigenetics, so that's the obvious thing. Um, but yeah, I think it's super, for me, it's interesting at least. <laughs> Okay, Lisa. Lisa had her hand up pretty much first, and I ignored her. Yeah, I'm Lisa. Because I didn't want to take favorites from oh, yeah. <laughs> people that used to be in my lab, so she got penalized. I'm Lisa Sigma. I used to be in Dana's lab. Uh, and I'm a PhD student in Fabian Tyson's group. I worked on the Human Lung Cell Atlas. And I just wanted to make a comment that's more about upstream of any of these queries, and that's also related to how we approached our integration for the Human Lung Cell Atlas. Um, we also did this benchmarking thing that Malta talked about before, and we noticed that all the methods that performed best perform um, batch correction at the uh, latent space level, let's say, embedding level. So we don't have any corrected gene counts um, in our integrated atlas. And I think a lot of the queries that we're talking about would actually ideally require batch corrected gene counts. So I think that's kind of an open problem. And um, yeah, I'm wondering if that's something we should uh, we should look into a bit more and if there's maybe ideas of people of how to quantify the quality of batch correction at the gene level. Yeah, I mean, that's always been my gripe against all these autoencoders that you lose the genes. And for me, you know, for losing the genes is, 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 is horrible. But, but the question is, and this I throw to Fabian and, and Nir, and Nir's on, on stage, so I'm gonna put him on the spot. Can we use the really good latent spaces that these autoencoders are able to do? And I do admit that the latent spaces are, are really good and use that as a guide to then figure out, you know, from the latent space how to correct gene counts. Like, can we, I mean, I think that would be an amazing innovation to yeah. work on. So, so um, when you look at the variation autoencoder, the, the entire beast, right? So it has two components. Uh, there is a component that gives rise to the latent space, but then there is another component, the decoder, that gives rise back to the data. Uh, I do understand that a lot of time people use, look at it just as a part of just uh, optimizing, just making sure that the likelihood of, uh, works okay and so on. But it is, in a sense, if you look at the generated data that comes out of it, it gives us some posterior estimate for what we can think about as the, or give us the expectation of the normalized data. Right? It's not perfect. There, there are, and and there is definitely, it's definitely an open, an open area the, in the high dimension part. Uh, of course, we have a lot of interest in that, but it is the case that uh, the VAEs are more than the latent space that they do, uh, they are, should be able to provide corrected yeah, well, data. Why, why don't people use the variational distribution so component of that? It depends that. who. <laughs> what? Um, no, no, but it, it is, it, it's, it's, it's definitely, um, more intuitive and it feels better, you know, just to work with the raw data and you say, okay, if I have enough samples, enough replicates and so on, I can mitigate batch effects and so on. I can tell you that, again, I don't want to advertise it, but, but in, in, in my lab, we're doing all these differential expressions and so on based on the VAEs. Uh, so this literature uh, exists, some other people are doing that. But I think it's especially somebody, you know, from the Thais lab or other people here that are working on these, that's definitely an area that requires attention. Yeah. Oh, Paulo Garcia from CCI, and thanks, Lisa, for sharing that. Um, that was an excellent point. Some of these queries do require to have uh, gene 
numerical values across all cells. And we recently implemented a feature to look for the expression of any given gene in, in a cell type in all the data that we have at cell wide gene. And this was one of the main uh, sort of uh, um, breakpoints that we had, that we didn't have a good method that doesn't use just like the latent space, but also gives us the gene numerical values. And we looked into SCVI because this is one of the few methods that can actually do that, that gives you a prob probabilistic estimation of gene expression. But we found two main issues. And when, with any other method, we found those issues. Scalability, we just couldn't implement it at the full scale of the data. We're working with more than three, four million cells at a given time. We need to run these like every day pretty much to like update with the data that we're ingesting. So scalability was one of them. And the other uh, issue was sparsity. You go from like a highly sparse data that's very easy to manage and easy to access to a complete dense matrix of probabilistic values. And that's just like impossible to manage at, at yeah. great scale. So and those of course were the they're connected things. to each other, these two, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so therefore we couldn't really implement any of this in the new feature. And we had to go with a very simplistic, sufficient way of doing it which we're not super happy about, but it's the, this is the thing that's actually working right now. Which is why I am, am a big advocate for sufficient statistics, because no one at the end of the day really cares about 60 million cells and the 20,000 expression values in each of these 60 million cells. And again, defining queries can define the stati sufficient statistics that we need for those queries to make computational efficiency possible if we sort of let go of the fact that our main entity is all the cells and all the genes kept at single cell resolution, which is, you know, one, impossible because integration always has trade-offs, and two, computationally just, you know, breaks us. There is something that can add to that is the work that people are doing, and I know from Dana's lab, from Smita Krishna, Krishna Swami's lab, from uh, John Marioni and so on, and, and for, from our lab as well. It's trying to make some estimations about the density in that, in that manifold, in the low dimensional manifold, and then uh, if you have enough cells, you can go into the, to the state where you're just sampling from the manifold in a way that can even be cell agnostic, or you can sample from the cells, but from that density. And if you have enough cells, that already starts providing solutions that can scale. So that's, that's one way to think about it. Another way is, is to try to, uh, to increase sparsity, so regularize models like that, but that's a, that's a different solution. Yeah. Oh, yeah, John. Uh, yes, we actually have two more questions from the online audience, both of which have received uh, multiple upvotes. Uh, so the first is from uh, Sergio Aguilar from uh, Holger Heinz team who asks uh, a question about marker genes. So we, he says, we can e easily obtain in a data-driven way marker genes when comparing a single cluster against the other. However, are marker genes useful to describe a trajectory? In other words, is there a gradient from the root subpopulation to downstream populations? And how do you manage those queries? So I, I think marker genes can definitely describe a trajectory because what you need to do is, is rather than look for genes that change between your query population in all else, you can look for genes that, you know, participate in and change uh, in an informative way along the trajectory, and we certainly have, have done that in, in the past. So we could add, you know, marker genes for a cell type or marker genes to, to, to track a trajectory because actually a lot of the computation you'll need is, is similar, so if we solve one, with minor tweaks, we solved the other. So we could even throw that in and, and make your query bigger so it will get more votes. I don't want to take too much more time because I want to sort of vote and get to the queries. Then oh, just oh, one please. comment on that, just in terms of methodology. Uh, and again, there has been work from multiple people here in the audience on that. It's the topic modeling approach, the matrix decomposition approach, and that uh, can give uh, maybe a the technical way to start addressing, trying to address these questions. So there's one other, is my cell model good? That I think people will want to ask. Like, does the, the cell line that I'm using in the lab reflect the biology in the you know, mm -hmm. human okay. tissue? And, and what, what is it closest to? That's important. Oh, oh, yes. Not necessarily, it's my most burning question, but I'm just trying to think about things that we know people are doing and somehow didn't come up. And one of them is, what other cells is my cell related to, which is not the same? Define related. Which is not in the same class. And related means is 
You, for example, I'll give the example that people think about a lot, a cell that could be the ancestor or the descendant of the cell, my cell. Mm -hmm. There is a whole literature, of course, and many people who are interested in this question. For some reason, it didn't come up here, so I was kind of trying to think. So related for you is the, related in, in lineage. Example, in this example, no, I, actually it's not lineage. It's not the right definition. It's related by fate. Related by fate. It means that it's an actual descendant of cell division, and that's impossible to answer in this. Okay, 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 yeah, related by fate. Related by fate. Yeah. Related by it's fate. Either an an it's, it's either, you know, it's either the descendant... An ancestor or, or a distant yeah. relevi From relative. From a fate mapping, not a lineage mapping perspective, if you want to be precise. Fate mapping, not yeah. use the word lineage here. Yeah, okay. Ever. It's never going to happen in a reference setting. So that's one that I think we, we have not heard. And the other one that I think we have not heard, we have heard genes and cells. Nir alluded a little bit to, to decomposition for programs in the context of... Uh, yeah, gene pro what but gene I programs is my cell expressing would be my vote. Query, people wanting to query a program and asking which cells use this program. By the way, not well defined because you can say individual cells, type of cells, locations in, in spatial, there's many, many... Not things. well defined because we haven't defined programs well yet. Yeah. <laughs> but people will come, at minimum, Dana, people will come with a set of genes, assuming that they are expressed in a, that they co vary together and will want to know where do I see this pattern. And that's actually not a trivial one to us. Yeah. So, so, so Viv is a, is a part of the, what we call a, a, the annotation vocabulary here and so on. So, and you mentioned this, I guess, uh, yesterday as well. So, so you see this as something to establish as well, these, these Yeah, these, we're uh, very obsessed with programs. categorizing whole cell profiles. Yeah. And it's actually a really narrow view of the biology mm -hmm. that's underlying, and it's going to restrict us more and more the further we go. The immunologists suffer from it already very heavily. People who study cells that are in multiple places, and you can kind of think of them as the same and not the same, depending on whether you look at them like this or you look at them like that. Yeah. So I mean, the I'm the a big believer in cell cross, type and gene programs as annotations for cells. We have, to, we have to really include the gene programs and, and not have a si single name and a single color. The fact that you know, we, we really write everything and just give a single label of a single cell type, and that's our current focus, is, is one of my uh, gripes. But, so we just you know, had... Just to say on that, I generally think that the cell type is just one kind of invariant program. That's all. Yeah. And in the same cell with that program, you have other programs that are running too. And, and, and that's the way we model it. Generalizable framework, that's all. Yeah. It's less cri critical for the querying question. It's just people today, right, like coming with a gene set. I don't care how they define it, and a gene set is just one simple version of programs. They like coming with a gene set and asking, where is that? And they definitely like asking about the ancestor uh, descendant thing. They call it lineage. It's actually the wrong term. And as I'm yeah. a stickler for terminology, I don't want to use that term. But, but I can see how that can be formed as a query, which can be very useful, maybe a bit more difficult to digest. But uh, if we really think about this, you know, the, the, the space in which cells are at and so on, like we, uh, so, so I, I think that, that, that can be definitely. Uh, yeah, what, what gene programs is my cell, you know, query? So yeah. I'm going to summarize the queries I heard and try to remember them. And um, do we let everyone vote for one or two queries when we're trying to sum it up? Let's do two. Let's do, okay, everyone gets to choose two queries. So, you know, I'm going to try and see if I remember everything. And you're going to see that I no longer have good memories because I'm old and, and over the hill. But, uh, okay, so, so we had, you know, where is uh, my gene expressed? Um, or, and, you know, actually, no, we had which marker genes can really f define these cell types? We have the, uh, yeah. oh, no, no, I'm testing my memory. The marker <laughs> genes, and uh, which had, you know, That's a bit of variations on the theme, marker genes that help trend, uh, uh, trajectories, and marker genes that, that allow for a sort and isolation. So that's the marker gene question. We had the, 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 the causal variant uh, uh, um, question. Can you mechanistically explain this causal variant, how it's impacting my cell, its niche, and its communication? Um, we had, um, is my cell model uh, good, and how messed up is my cell line relative to the in vivo biology that's in uh, the atlas? Uh, we had, where is my gene expressed spatially? Uh, we had, where is my gene program 
expressed. I'm, I'm at five. Um, and then we had what gene programs does my cell express, which was mine. Um, and uh, let's... I am going to include in the queries how do we get the genes corrected from our uh, latent embeddings, even though it's not really a biological query, but I just think we should throw it in there. Well, I know that there were more. Um, can you help me with some of the other ones? Oh, yeah, oh, change. Yeah. That was a really important one. And that we're, we were going to let that be, you know, can we uh, define a change under a perturbation, which would include um, what genes change in different cell types, what cell type proportions change. And, you know, we let that one be comprehensive, even though that is, is a whole can of worms. Uh, <laughs> And what oh. is my cell type related to? And what is my, yeah, and what is the, my cell type related to in, in fate mapping? So, you are going to read out the different um, oh God. queries. <laughs> oh, okay, uh. you want, you want to, you want to, you, you should run the votes. Sure. Um. And, 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 uh, so, I didn't actually number them, I just have typed notes of all the. Okay. Oh, you already have votes coming in. Okay, you guys are going to tabulate your votes, and we're going to take votes in the audience. Do you want to run that? Yeah, but I need, I need the list. You need the list. <laughs> <laughs> I failed in my duties. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's not in the order that Dana said. Oh, no, forget my order. Just do any old order. And I just tried to rem remind everyone so they can decide what to vote for. But now give your order so that it will match the order that you know, John is tallying from our audience. From our so, number one is what are my micro, uh, what are my marker genes? Okay, who votes for Where that? What are my marker genes expressed and trajectories? Okay, do you want to count? Uh, uh, oh God. Okay, let's count. Okay. Uh, can you mechanistically explain my cause? Wait, 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 wait. We're still counting one of our marker genes. Okay. You get two votes. Yeah. Okay, we have nine. Nine from here. Okay, nine for the marker genes. Okay, next question is the mechanistic... Causal variance. Causal variance. Mechanistic causal variance. Five. Okay, next. Is my cell model line good and representative of in vivo biology? Okay. I think there's going to be a lot of ties here. Nine, okay. Where is my gene expressed spatially? Seven. Seven. Where is my gene program expressed? Fifteen. Oh. oh. What cell types express my gene program? Well, that, no, that's related. That's the same question. There's, there's like what gene pro the the, qu the different one was what gene programs does my cell express? So let's do that one. What gene programs do my what cell, cell express? What cell type is my cell type, or what cell types is my cell type related to? Related. Okay. So then we had related, we had a few um, interpretations, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, people aren't voting for that one, at least not, okay. Zero. Uh, oh, no. oh, yes, uh, correction of latent, or taking late, going from latent space to gene counts? Was that one of them? Yeah, correct, correcting the gene counts in latent space. Yeah. Oh, that's a popular one. Okay. Fifteen. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, there was change. Yeah, the change one. Change. Change. What changes? All right. Twelve. Twelve. And I, I, what uh, cell programs are? What what gene programs are uh, described in my cell? Uh, I think we, we did that. that one. We did that one. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay, so do you want to tally the votes because you have all the online one votes as well? This is sort of fun to see. I mean, all of these questions are important, and hopefully That's with good. time, uh, we will solve all of them. Okay, so uh, a number of them were tied with three upvotes. So one is uh, what cell types express my gene program. Awesome. And are you are you combining the audience and online or just the online? This is just online. Okay, so you're going to combine them. And our audience is requesting more time to vote. We need some. We need to integrate has, the questions. That's uh, that now has four votes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And now we're cutting off voting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we, Yes. Yeah, but we, we wrote, did you write down the votes? Oh, you wrote down the votes? Great, Lisa. So, okay, so we're going to, so please add what John reads out and get the final tap. So then with three votes, what is my cell type related to? Also with three votes, where are my, my marker genes expressed? And the question about trajectories. Uh, game of three votes, is there, uh, oh, this was actually not one of the queries, sorry. Uh, with two votes, um, where is my gene expressed spatially? Also with two votes, is my cell model or cell line a good and representative of in vivo biology? Uh, with one vote then is correcting cell count from latent space. Uh, where is my gene program expressed, which we combined with another one? Um, can uh, one, one vote also for can you mechanis mechanistically explain my causal variant? Uh, and then what changes, which came in last, came with zero votes. We're going to discuss 10 minutes each the three most popular queries. Okay, so. Okay, so so the top three then here. Where where is my gene expressed? Gene program. Where is my gene program expressed? Okay, so that bundles together these two concepts of spatial querying and uh, and uh, gene program identification, right? And the second one was, I forgot now already. Right. So so uh, the second one was batch batch effect correction in yeah, in gene expression space and other artifacts, right? Okay. And the third one was just contextualizing comparative studies uh, in the human cell atlas. Okay, so as Dana said, all the questions that were raised here, they are all critically important, right? It's not that you are trying to vote what you're going to work on and what not, but this gives us some priority of what to discuss next. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we, we have 38 minutes to, to discuss, so, so, so let's start. What? No, no, 38 minutes total, so we have 10 minutes for each and then like eight minutes to summarize next steps. So let's work on, on the first one. Um, so again, I think defining, you know, what is two things which I sort of want to discuss and throw at the audience. You know, what is faithful biology? What is, you know, what is a good answer? And like one of the things that, that always bug me is even the simple question of how do I aggregate, you know, genes in a gene program? Do I just like s take the mean or, or the sum? Do some genes matter more than other for a gene program? I mean, most of what we do with these gene signatures is just some type of median or, or sum of the gene program, but that really doesn't capture the gene program. So one, how can we faithfully capture the gene program? You know, what is good? sufficient statistics for it because one of the problems with biology that I've encountered is, is that there are so many gene programs that are overlapping in their genes and you can score really high using like a very standard blunt score genes approach for other gene programs that have overlapping genes. So, you know, how do we even evaluate when the gene program is being faithfully expressed, especially given dropout, uh, which you know we don't know if 
the gene program isn't being expressed because we didn't capture some important genes or it's not being expressed because another gene program is actually driving the expression of those overlapping genes. So how do we get faithful biology and what sufficient statistics do we need to, to collect to give a really good answer that's not confounded by how complicated and interconnected biology is? So to the audience. Both, you know, biologically, you know, how do we get something faithful, define what a good answer is, and computationally, how do we actually extract a, a statistic from the data that will help us? So I'm, I'm not a mathematician or anything, but as a first step, I would say if you have related gene programs, somehow pick a representative, combine, like computationally, you can calculate how similar are they, how much overlap do they have. And then you can at least reduce the space of things you're looking at to not so correlated. No, the, the related gene programs are related but distinct. They have overlapping genes, but you don't want to aggregate them. You want to distinguish them. It's the, the pure opposite. And yes, actually, that's one of the advantages of spectra because it takes all the, the gene programs into account. It's, allowed, it's able to explain away some gene expression saying, you know, actually, the gene expression I see here by taking all gene programs into account as ones is more likely driven by these pro gene programs. And if we say the cell is expressing gene, these gene programs, it's unlikely that the expression I see here. So, you know, one way to do it is to really query about more than one gene program at a time to make sure that you're not getting, you know, some confounding gene program, but then you know, what gene program, there are so many gene programs, how do we do it efficiently? So looking at the other gene programs, if they could be alternative explanations really helps, but it, even doing that efficiently in which gene programs is a mess. Actually, let's go back because the back hasn't talked yet. Can we can we pass the mic and or? turn it on? Is it a battery? <laughs> need need a new mic. Hello. Okay, great. So um, I'm Mohammed Shoaib. I'm a PhD student at uh, Santa Ana's Children's Cancer Hospital here in Vienna, uh, and uh, I've recently thought about this uh, question of gene sets and which gene sets that are uh, maybe more interesting or that are more relevant to some part of the, of the manifold more than the other. And I think for the single cell, uh, unlike RNA-seq, we need two statistics. Like for RNA-seq, if you have uh, enrichment of a gene set, this would be interesting. But I think for the single cell RNA-seq, you need enrichment and you need uh, autocorrelation, spatial autocorrelation. So for example, if you have a, a data set, a large data set, where a gene set is uh, expressed or enriched in all of the cells. I don't think this would be an interesting gene set if it is expressed equally in all the cells. So I think a gene set, uh, another statistic, would be to calculate like spatial autocorrelation. So are like you talking about spatial and spatial transcriptomics like no, no. Uh, it can be or any spatial space. on the manifold? I, I mean like uh, first start by calculating the enrichment of gene set across all cells and then look for the gene set that are differentially enriched in parts of the embedding by using something like Moran's eye or, or to look at the gene sets that uh, specify or active. It's a program that is active in a specific part of the embedding. So, so I have a question back at you. Are our gene sets good? I mean, as I sort of said yesterday, our gene sets were derived you know, from bulk data from cell lines 20 deca two decades ago. And, you know, I think the first question is, of course, a biologist, you know, that's really smart and, and, and deep in, into the biology can define, you know, here is my hard list of genes, and I know that these are the important genes, and they're my gene program, even though I tell that biologist that I could probably refine their gene program from the data. But then there's like, how do we even define good gene programs, Query Aviv? I think people think the gene sets 
that they use now were defined from genomics data, that's actually not the reality at all. They were defined from hard-earned experimental biology. Okay? Some of them. It depends. The There's a ton of crap. A lot of them were defined by the hard-earned, painstaking work of our predecessors to like say, this is oxidative phosphorylation. That was biochemistry and cell biology and genetics. It wasn't human genome. It wasn't genomics. The genomics then kind of showed, oh, they're actually co-regulated together as well. So I just, I just want to say that because I felt that we several times say, oh, the old stuff is like, no, There's a lot of crap there. The, the I mean, point maybe is be better the curated. regulatory view is broader than that and narrower than that. Meaning you can start with something like that and in terms of the signal from the gene expression, for example, if you look at RNA or something else, you would find that it kind of agrees with it, but there's more and there's less, right? Some belong, some don't, or their relationships are more subtle. But if people kind of go to the olden days of gene ontology, say, they remember they had like these three sources of evidence and there's like, oh, I can't remember by now. There was like, the, sometimes it was the literature citation, sometimes it was the biochemical assay and there's high throughput data. But it's not dominated always by, by you know, high throughput assays and actual gene expression. So they're not actually coming from biochemical But I think assays. we could do a better job with I'm our data I'm not saying right that now. it can't be improved. I'm not saying that there aren't a ton of blind spots, maybe, maybe, meaning things that are just not there, and then you get the, ex the pattern in the data, and you realize it's not similar to anything. And that's what Fabian asked yesterday. In those cases, it has no name. It's a list of genes. Sometimes those genes are better or worse characterized. You look at it, and you know what people do then? They actually do a go enrichment to try and give it a name, because they don't know what to do with all these genes. They, it's just a thing. It's a thing without a name. It's very, very hard to study. I just wanted to, I think sometimes we don't yeah, we understand have to the depth it. of work that goes into saying this is what that thing does. The yeah. fact that we have the pattern is wonderful. But then the question is how do we get to, maybe you asked so, the question so maybe, about maybe the function, just to, um, right? Earlier on, somebody said something. I would want to know what the function of the thing is. That's, that's still hard. So, it's so, kind of not a question, not a comment. It's just to remember where the really hard stuff lies. Yeah, no, for sure. So adding to that, I think it, it, we look at it a lot ourselves and just I can say that the discrepancies come from the fact that a lot of these evidence are not, don't come from transcriptional assays, right? And we see that and we don't necessarily see it in gene expression patterns and that creates um, some inconsistency. A lot of these come from different contexts as well. So even yeah. though for the other context, it was very good biology, you know, there's a lot of context specificity that's not taken into account in many of that's these. That's correct. Things. Exactly. So, so, okay, so, and, and just adding one more thing to that is that maybe the, uh, this sense of uh, criticism towards these also come from the fact, maybe it's because of the statistics we're using, but a lot of time what comes up is it's like very large gene sets of, okay, metabolic activity. Yep. What am I going to do with that? Right? So, um, but that really has to do with the, um, uh, your judgment as somebody who applies these tools and what, uh, which of these sets to use and which not. Um, Yeah. It's not, it's not refined enough in terms of the signal that needs, that you really want to pick out. We can improve a lot on these. Yeah. There has been very little relative attention to this compared to how to group cells together. Yes. Or how to, it's kind of funny because in the past it was exactly the opposite. Then the cells showed up and we all got so excited. Because there are a lot of cells. It's like, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm totally with you here. So, so I have a question to, to the audience, and then we'll move on to the next can, query. Can I, can I just, because... Yes, that was mine. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. I, yeah, thanks, actually, Joachim Schulz from Bonn, uh, that you mentioned that, because I think I'm, I'm absolutely uh, in, have the same opinion, because with the single day cell data, we could actually continue working on that programs, because what we very often see now, if you apply these old old programs to the single cells yeah and you then look for different cell types and the genes that are actually making the call in these old programs that are diff they are different 
uh, due to the yeah. cell types. So we could actually integrate that. I forget this is another community effort, of course. Yeah, we, we can integrate improve the gene the, programs, the programs given the data that we have. On a cell type specific, or you know, whatever you call them, but cell state, cell type specific manner, because they are informative, but since they came from bulk data, you have an integrating effect in these programs, but if you now link them to the cell types and the resolution we have, I think that would be a starting point. Yeah, I definitely think Not it's a worthy the effort to use the data that we have to improve the gene programs, gene sets. And, and not to mention that if you change the sets of genes on which you do the original embedding, the relationships between the cells change. Oh, yes. Just so take the cell cycle and genes, embed your cells, they all make a nice circle. Well, feature selection when you're building your embedding is one of the most important things. That's what I, but, you know, but people each don't... Of them will, it's not like there's one right one, right? No, 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 no. This is why the query matters. This is why the biology matters. So first the query, then the features you're going to use to the cluster and build your neighbor graph and build your embedding. And then how do you get a faithful answer? It's all, it, it, all, it all depends. There's no one size fits all. I can make five different embeddings, which will be equally valuable for different questions that will highlight different yet each important biology. Yeah. So, so and, and just to add one technical comment here, so that this kind of calculation of finding those gene programs, so it can be based on embedding, as, as, as you said right here, autocorrelation, it's a good example for that, right? But it doesn't necessarily have to be based on the embedding. It can be decoupled from the embedding. When we just look at the, uh, at the genes, either in the smoothed uh, uh, form or in the raw form, and uh, that is also an area that I think requires still a lot of attention in, in finding those relations between genes in an embedding free way that is that is that we can trust and it's reproducible. So yeah. this sort of goes to the embedding. I mean I think there's the, the, the two questions that we just asked uh, or the two top queries are are very interconnected because you know there's a lot of feature selection that we do. One of the most common wheel crank feature selection that we Came, came around to doing is let's take the X highly variable genes. Uh, X is sometimes, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, I've seen 5,000, but you take these highly variable genes, you check out the rest of the genome and then drive everything else, you know, from there. It's particularly problematic in the autoencoder embeddings where, you know, you really build these, wh where everything is, is, is in the latent space. And so I'm wondering how, you know, even for these autoencoders, we could use these gene programs, which obviously encode for biology, which we care about once we've figured those out a little bit better. Uh, you know, I think it would be very interesting, rather than PCA, to, to sort of do a, a cell by gene programs as input to, to these autoencoders that would be more biological. I think that that would actually, you know, it doesn't actually solve, uh, in, you know, getting the, the genes back from the latent space, but it will get a latent space that's maybe more biologically faithful that will be easier to get better genes back. So, you know, do we want to talk a few minutes about getting the genes back? You're the one who thought about this the most. So share your wisdom with, with the world. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's an endeavor that can happen, getting the genes back, either uh, using the gene programs in the middle uh, or, or not. And maybe a way to think about it is to see what are the, who is the giant on whose shoulder we are standing, which is all the machine learning uh, a community that is mostly in, 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 uh, in computer vision. Uh, and there, these autoencoders, the variation autoencoders are used to... Um, I used to generate images, right? Um, and to do all sorts of things with those images, but uh, among other things here, to run classifications on it, but also to smooth images and correct noise and compress. So, um, so in a sense, that means that there is hope to be able to do that and to do that properly. To say that we are there entirely, okay, we are working on it actively. I'm sure that uh, other groups are working on this and it's important endeavor. I think it's, it's possible. Connecting this to the uh, to the um, transitional programs or to the gene, exp or no, I should say, to the gene programs, right? Uh, that that we can involve in this process. I think that's definitely um, um, a, a good idea. The question is, where do we take these programs, right? And how do we approach this? Again, this goal of having a vocabulary um, of 
gene programs that we can work with and we can feel confident that we have the, uh, the, the most relevant set. I mean, to me, it kind of feels like it's a problem of scales, right? And each of these different scales, like at the gene set level, I think it's equally valid and very relevant for biologists who want to test stuff. But also with gene programs, which are a bit more abstract, perhaps, that might be less relatable, but it doesn't make it any less val oh, invalid, right? And maybe to have some defined structure of these scales would be helpful in the long run. So I, I'm not sure I really understand the point. I mean, we were talking about essentially scaling from like, you know, there's these gene programs, uh, maybe they're continuous, they have weights associated with them, and then, you know, there's this other layer on top of it where maybe we have a cutoff cut off based on variability from our data set, right? And there are these various scales of essentially understanding the data where one might have these pros for one particular context and the query again, and the other has the other, but I don't think, I think both can be addressed. Yeah. So I, I, you raised it, uh, oh, it's almost a, a diversion to, to another topic that didn't come, uh, actually maybe it did come up here uh, in the comparative analysis, but it's really um, connecting our querying of the atlas to, to the metadata and to uh, s sample attributes and so on, right? And we can say, okay, this gene program, we're seeing it in myeloid cells, but it's really specific for that specific type of samples, right? Um, and uh, and so yes, this is very important, right, to contextualize what we're doing. That's why we are running, to me, when I think about these gene programs, right, and using this metadata-driven way of thinking about the, the data and so on, the, we are striking a balance here between letting the data speak for itself or putting prior knowledge into the model, right? And to say that, the, I, mean, I don't think we know exactly what's the right balance there, and I think that's a journey that we're going to have to go through, and that's one of the interesting questions ahead. I, I actually want to throw something to some of the, you know, even though, you know, this is a very biased set of biologists because they're sitting here with us, um, you know, first of all, I'd just like to say about these autoencoders that what I really like about them is that they do provide a measure of uncertainty, which isn't, you know, given frequently enough about, about things. But let's say we do uh, derive the genes uh, directly from, from, the, deco from the, the, the decoder uh, with their associated uncertainty. One of the things that, you know, in, in my encounter with a lot of biologists is there's like what's measured and what's computed. And, you know, like this was done by molecular biology, so I believe it. And this was done by, you know, a computer, so I don't. And, you know, I've always had issues with that because, well, you've measured all this ambient RNA in your cell, that's utter crap, and you've measured all these sort of doublets and all these other experimental, like there's, there's a lot of errors in, in, in molecular biology. You put molecules in a tube, they can get very creative. And, and somehow, you know, and this is maybe my gripe as a computational scientist, if molecular biology gave it to me, ambient RNA and all, it's fine. If I dared impute something, you know, I'm a heretic. Validate. It just reminds me of how people used to be required. Where? I'm still asked for that in my reviews. <laughs> required me to too. validate um, their RNA-seq with qPCR. Yeah. Ah, okay. Which is, yes. in fact, an okay, inferior no, no, we're, we're way of quantifying. That, finally, thank God. So now have, still there's many stories. Yeah. The, it's just and proteins. Uh, pr bulk proteins and, 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 and fish to validate. The, the very, I, I very the new and unreliable technology of single-cell RNA-seq. There's always the validation slide with the QPCR at the end. But but it but but the transformed biologists in this audience, and well, maybe I'm you know, may, or first of all, are the tr biologists in this audience transformed to sort of somewhat trust computation? What what? How did we get your trust? If we got your trust, and if we don't have your trust, then tell us why. Um, yeah, sorry. So, um, uh, if I may, I have a question. So, oh. I, I'm Michaela from um, Helmholtz Munich. Um, so, I, mean, I think we kind of moved on from cell programs to uh, the embedding to gene, right? Yeah. So, I think, um, so regarding the latter, I was just wondering, so um, it's a good point that you say we, we do trust, like, the expression, the measured data, or we do tend to trust that more than, say, if you impute something based on an embedding. But I think, um, 
I guess in the end it kind of comes down to what do we, uh, how much do we, like how well do we understand like Western biases come from or how much do we believe we understand because um, um, yeah, so that kind of uh, might explain why we might uh, trust the measurements more than what a model gives us. But that's also then, we kind of have the same problem with the model as well, right? So uh, how do you know what exactly the model is doing? Um, because in the end, like if you have like an autoencoder, it, it um, selects its features based on something we don't exactly know or we don't exactly control. And one of the aims of say interpretable ma machine learning is to understand like what is the model capturing? Is it actually capturing the things that we are trying to find, the things that we can understand? And I think that's like a huge challenge in itself to be able to um, yeah, make sense of um, a corrected feature space and yeah, uh, in that way. So, so, so there, there are more and more tools that allow you to go under the hood in the autoencoder and say which features brought you to this prediction. Yes. Yes. So can you think of doing that to say, I think it's this gene because of this, you know, again, the, the evidence, not only this is the gene expression, not only this is the, you know, distribution certainty of the gene expression, but this was the evidence that, that the autoencoder used to get there. Yeah, th that's true. So, so, so there are all these tools for uh, interpretable uh, machine learning, uh, and those are good. But I'm, I'm not sure if this is, I mean, that's one way to approach this and to think about it. I think another way that can be more conceptually more simpler is to think about, or to, to use the fact that we're starting to have a lot of samples. Once you start having a lot of samples, it makes integration easier, first of all. And second of all, it also gives you a way to see how well the integration works and what does it mean, right? Imagine you're learning a model based on some percent of your data, then you just overlay some other percentage of your data, you see, see how it works, see if it makes any sense, because that, to me, is the ultimate challenge, right? Do you generalize? Um, yes, I think, I, I'm, so I agree with this, but I think maybe the focus should also be on like how do we evaluate if something works, right? You say like it works, it makes sense, but like how do we know if it does make sense? Yeah, but, in the but end, if you want to check something, it's always based on like a prior assumption of I expect to see this, I expect to see that. Yeah, um, so, so th that's again, a very good point is that there is expectation and we need to, to ha have this layer of model criticism for any model, right? Not just for the VE, VAEs, for any matrix decomposition or any other model that we have that we look at data, um, but the tools in which we are looking at that, right? So we can try to build all these fancy tools to, to, look at the, uh, to look at what the network is doing or to enforce linearity at some point or to enforce some regularization on the network to get some topic from these neural networks. There have been all these work that's been done and is valid, but that's not necessarily something we, um, we need. So a, a simpler approach here would be to say, do for example differential expression and say, oh, is the difference here between that part of my cluster and this part of my cluster, does it mean anything? Right, so you do differential expression, then you get an idea of, okay, well, what does it tell me? What is this embedding tell me, right? So I think that model criticism is one aspect, is one side of things, but we should not forget the other side of things where you can take the, da the data, the embedding, and, right, and just try to see what it means, right? I, I hope that makes sense, the distinction here. Yeah. Well, may, may, I don't know whether you were just being a little provocative, Dana, but I think, I mean, I think biologists want to trust Com uh, uh, tr trust always comes with verification, right? I think if we're good scientists, what we do is we do experiments. We, we, we verify by some orthogonal method. I yes. think that, that's, that's always key to science, mm -hmm. whether it's doing molecular biology, you, know, you do a Western blot and you do RNA expression, and, you know, you, you want to verify by, by two methods, right? You do computation. It tells you something you want to look by some other method. What, that's, that's, that's what we do. Yeah. So... You know, I think that, that's also a very valid point, right? Uh, of having the uh, multiplicity of methods, um, definitely uh, seeing I mean, robustness. What, yeah. One way, by the way, to distinguish batch and biology, again, we can throw it back on the experimentalists. If we take a sample and query it by multiple technologies, uh, we, we, we as you know, have a better way to... Yeah. Because, you know, part of this autoencoder is it's actually trying to really change the values because it's trying to correct for batch and, and weird stuff that, that really does exist in the data. It's trying to remove ambient RNA that really does exist in the data. So measuring data using multiple technologies will really help us learn better 
to distinguish batch and biology, which, you know, it's, it's a lesson that we can then take back and try and build better methods that now have some hook to distinguish batch and biology, which is one thing that we're currently doing quite poorly in, in data integration, unfortunately. Basically, the, the um, distinction right now that they're using is if it's more subtle, it's batch, and if it's more big, it's biology, but there's a lot of subtle, important biological changes as well. And there are unfortunately also a lot of very big batch effects, um, even though we're getting better here. I think we need to move on to the next query. Uh, so you, since you gave three queries and we have like so now nine we're minutes, one, right? so yeah. choose one of Query you actually want to make. Yes. So, in, so for example, individual patients, they could be actually a batch because you're looking for commonalities and you want to m remove that, and they could be the key thing because you're looking at human genetic uh, variation. Yeah, for me, batch is a technical thing so that I shouldn't be there. So I think we need there. to be careful with our again the the uh, you it's mean a great zone. Batch, I'll be more you careful with the terminology. Variation that is actually not involved with any biology, but in many cases you actually do want to remove variation that is associated with real biology yeah. because you're looking for generalizations. Yeah. Okay. And in others, you do not. And it really depends Everything on the question. Everything depends on the query. On the I definitely yeah. agree with, with you there. Yeah. So which differences would you want us to discuss for eight minutes? Hmm. What? I'm saying, where do you get the eight minutes from? We are already over time according to the schedule. Well, I have this oh. clock right here that's ticking away. I mean, it we says nine minutes. And <laughs> it says nine minutes on it. Uh, I have a clock ticking here. We, we, did, we did add 10 minutes onto this <laughs> session, so we are going 10 minutes later. OK. OK. So I mean, the other thing we can talk about, um, because we really have nine more minutes, is what we should do together as a community going forward so that we could have some action. I'm sorry to, like, actually, I voted for your query. So uh, but yeah, we maybe should t spend our last nine minutes talking about um, next steps. So we, we had a lot of discussion here. What can we do together as a community? You, you want to? Uh, yes, yes. Hello, I'm Hao, Hao Yuan. I am come from Karolinska Institute. And then we are now. Uh, generating and uh, human skin, uh, human cell outlets for skin. And then um, I, in my study, I have a lot, uh, we have our own data sets, and we also, um, we also um, get some data, existing data sets for, that is available. And my question is that when we find out some data sets, maybe the qualities of the cells are different. For example, we are using our own sequence, Mark 6 3 cells. And, and many uh, studies, they use some Tanex or some other technologies. And some cells, um, when they sequence them, they maybe even over sequenced, overload the cells. So their depths are very low, but our cells, the depth is very high. So I'm wondering uh, how to evaluate the, like the qualities or some informatics, because uh, we know that the smart 6 3 cells should be more informatics, and we are also like to generate the models, and we want to the model learn more about the, uh, the smart 6 3 cells instead of the overload tannic cells. So I have two questions. First, so this, this is, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, this is not a Q&A session. Yes. We're trying to wrap up. We had, you know, yeah, so we're trying to wrap up community efforts yeah. rather than do a Q&A session. So yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, yes, my question, one is uh, how to evaluate the, like the quality and information of uh, volumes of the cells. And the second thing is when we change the models, how can we just, uh, regard more about the cells, that we think they will be more informative. Okay, so, yeah. so these are two very important questions about the QC and about the scrutiny of models, and we, we can add them to the list of questions that we had. And, uh, and Yeah, and, and if anyone has experience with that, maybe someone can reach out to Howe in, in, in the break and, and, and share their experiences with, 
with how on on that specific thing. But I think you know, is there anything? And you know, there we we raised a lot of queries, which I hope will be summarized somewhere. And it's definitely queries that are important for us to to, to engage with going forward. But is is there any community effort that we can do? Is there anything that someone here is gung ho about? You know, taking the torch and charging forward. Can we? take our discussion and turn it into action items, and that includes people who are gung-ho, like myself, about uh, how does my sample differ over time after perturbation, which would be the one that I would go gung-ho about personally, but that's me. But, it, but you know, if it, the, both the two queries that we tried to discuss a bit more and any of the other queries uh, that didn't get voted as high but are near and dear to your heart, what can we do going forward? Uh, when you are using a reference from a different species and you are integrating your data, uh, you are faced with the problem of uh, the homology, like uh, matching the genes. And because you don't have a lot of, uh, sometimes you don't have only one to one, but you have multiple to, to one and uh, the opposite. So you end up to making a decision, and this decision might not be uh, biologically driven. So mostly like computationally, you only select only the genes that are one to one, or maybe put things to lowercase and then use the, those genes. So I think that it would be great if there is like a, a table that is uh, matches and like can be used to do the matching when you map one species to the other, like from mouse to human, uh, that can be a reference uh, for everything. So we, we, we're getting more queries rather than solutions, yeah. but here's another one. How can we, we map um, Pablo? Yeah, I just want to say that at Cellwagen, we're working in some of the queries that we talked about. We have a lot of uh, challenges in that. Scalability is, is the main one that, that we're inquiring. Well, there's scalability, which is what Cell by Gene is always focused on, but our current answer for any of these queries are wrong. So there is how, what is the right answer? You know, screw scalability or what is the right answer on a smaller set? Okay. Like how do you do it by, I mean, and this is an argument that I've had with Ambrose over many lunches. Our current solutions still suck. We and need a better solution, and then we can work on and scalability. And we're very happy to hear from the community about what are the right solutions, because sometimes we feel there's a dis disconnect that you're talking about, uh, about our efforts, computational efforts, and what the biologist wants. So please feel free to reach out to us uh, if you have, especially for gene programs, we're in the middle of like getting Yeah, the cell by gene people listen, I'll, I'll, I'll say. I mean, you know. They, they, so if they, there's a solution for the gene program, how do you define it, how to best define it, please come talk to us and we'd like to So I think Fabian has uh, something to add to the community effort there. Fabian? Yeah, so I have two suggestions with respect to community. One is the one sort of really hands-on with respect to the, the, the not exact questions, but the tools, right? Remember, we've been putting together this SC verse where we try to get mm -hmm. people together. Neil was also advertising this briefly. So I think it's actually useful to make sure that at least in this sort of smaller set of frameworks, we make sure that this stuff is compatible. I think it was crazy how many different Atlas platforms we saw today. So let's try to make sure that at least we can somehow sync uh, a little bit on the programming side of things. Yeah. I think that's no, actually happened. No gorilla chat speeding of uh, here's mine. Yeah. But uh, let's try and build community. The, 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 sec the second part I briefly oh. wanted to say was with respect to these actual questions. Remember, we put our postdocs and PhDs at some point together to do something like that. Yeah. I think we should reinvigorate this with these very specific sort of two tasks, I think, that you just define now. Just like have somehow this really from people actually doing if stuff, driven question to then potentially do something like, like if hackathon. If there's people in the like audience, I'll people on that. Zoom, or friends of people uh, Anna, that heard I, this. Can I just say something directly sure. related to what Fabian said? The trick to having a good answer is to ask the question yeah. in an extraordinarily precise and well-defined way. Yes. And almost all of these questions are not well-defined. Yes. That's why the answers end up being dissatisfying. And the exercise that uh, Fabian refers to where a few of our people met together ended up being that we couldn't even define one of those cleanly enough to actually say this is well defined. The, to me, They did the have fun though trying to define it. I think it was a good exercise for all of them. It was a fantastic exercise and it could get to the point that it actually is well defined. Maybe not for every question, but if you can't define the question well, don't go and answer it. No, no, of so course, what is the question? I, what is I the query? How do you taking define it? Even just the three that were said today or even just one of them and getting it to its crispness, which might actually make it multiple questions because people use one banner and they actually mean many different things. 
then that is something you can go to, right? And you say, now I, I build this, there's multiple technical solutions to this, and they can become better and better. But this piece, the definition, the definition is, I agree. Here we're completely free. agreed. Yeah. Getting the th right definition, getting the yeah, right question, don't like definition. stating I'm it accurately. Sure. We were, again, for the sake of time and communal discussion, very loosey-goosey here. Uh, but, um, but definitely, you know, I hope it seeded some ideas. I hope it seeded some appetite for people who might be, you know, wanting to get together um, and I think people needs to be, you know, a combination of biologists and computer scientists working hand in hand to get a crisp definition and to try and push forward on some of these queries. If, 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 if a group of people really is, is, is charged about anything, then, then you should let us know. You want to add something? No, yes, indeed. It was, uh, well, thank you, everybody. It was a great session. Uh, Donna, thank you for all the thoughts. And, and I think we have a, a list here of queries, and that was, at least for me personally, I can say it was very helpful. So thank you. Uh, but but uh, let's hope that this is the start of a way that we can engage, really, and think about things in a, in a more standardized way, and we can just make some joint effort here towards these, these very important questions. So thanks, everybody. And uh, yeah, good to see you.